Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, last week about this time, we were in worship service with my son and his wife in New York at their home church. Excuse me, let me close this door. And we were in the worship service and we had stood and we had sang and, and given praise to God and they were doing like we do here. They had taken time to greet one another to say good morning and happy new year. And uh, at about that time, my wife who was standing beside me took a seat and that was no big thing. We had been doing a lot, so I thought maybe she was just tired and sitting down. And then I felt her hand grasp my pant leg about my thigh and she began to put a tourniquet on my leg. And I looked down at her and she was listing bad. And she looks at me with this strange look on her face and she goes, I'm not feeling so well. And I go, what? And I look at her and she goes, I think I'm gonna throw up. And I'm going, okay, this is getting weird. And so I'm looking at her, I'm going, is she just tired? Is she got a cough, what's going on? And it just started to get really, really bad. Long story short, we had to take her out of the, out of the service because she was not doing well. She was in intense pain. Uh, about an hour, 10 minutes later, we finally got an ambulance there and rushed her to the ER. Okay, that's, that's not true. We drove very slowly to the ER. You don't drive fast through the streets of New York anywhere. And so we, we drove very slowly to the ER and then spent another hour waiting for the deliverance of the Lord. During that time, I was texting a lot of people that I know who are prayer warriors. And I asked them to pray for my wife because she was in excruciating pain. And um, the pain started like this. If this is zero and this is 10, or should I say from zero to 10, it went from zero to 10. It was like that. And so, and then it just kind of pegged out at 10. It was so bad at one point, the doctor, I don't know if she remembers this, the doctor said, is your pain at 11 or 12 now? <laughs> That's how bad it was. it was, it was that bad. And then about two and a half hours into the ordeal, the pain went from 10 to zero. It just stopped. And so I credit the grace and the mercies of God through the vehicle of the prayers of the saints for that moving because there was no reason for it to do what it did. The, the doc came back after they did the test and they said, oh, we figured it might be because we ruled out the Jordan thing. It wasn't, we, that was the first thing, we had to rule out the Jordan thing. Um, the gallbladder, no, head, all of it is bad. <laughs> it was a process of elimination. The only thing we never considered was a kidney. I never considered a kidney stone. Kidney, uh, no, bladder, all, oh, yeah. But the doc came back and says, oh yeah, she has a little boulder in there. And uh, yeah, I mean, inside that, it, small things are big inside there. And so that was what caused the pain. And, and I have never had a kidney stone, uh, but I've talked to people who have, but this is the first time I've actually watched someone go through the ordeal. I would not wish that on anyone, uh, but uh, yes, it, uh, four millimeters, they said, was the size of the stone. Huge enough to cause incredible pain, but not large enough they needed to do surgery. Thank God for that. Uh, but I do, I thank God for that deliverance, and I thank you for this, your uh, prayer, saints, because those who stood with us in prayer, I tell you, it just, it didn't decrease, it didn't fade, it just turned off. It just stopped. And they were like, well, we need to give her pain pills. I said, okay, give her whatever, but she has not, since that moment, you correct me if I'm wrong, experienced any pain since the touch of the Lord. And so the doc said, you have to pass the stone as you pass it, because it had gone through the, the what do you call it, too? The ureter. And, and uh, he said it had come to the top of the bladder, so now it's just a matter of passing it. But, and he said, that should be uncomfortable, but you should be able to deal with it. But we haven't had any of that either. So I just thank God that, praise God, 
that God hears prayers. I'm telling y'all, God is a, is a, he knows what we need. He knows what we need. And um, when you find yourself in a helpless situation, it's good to know you got a helpful God. Amen. So all you mothers and wives and fathers who are praying for your, your sons and daughters who've been deployed, you got a helpful God. He hears your prayers. He hears your prayers. Those who stood at the altar this morning praying for specific needs, God is a helpful God. He hears our prayers and he moves on our behalf. So don't, don't fret, don't worry. God has you right where he wants you. Amen. So let's pray over the word this morning. I am so glad to be back in the, in, in the fellowship of God's people this morning here at home. As I uh, share with a number of you this morning, it was good to be gone. I enjoyed very much being with my, my son and his wife and our grandchildren in particular. Uh, but it is good to be home. It's good to be back where God has called us to be. And uh, we're just glad to be here. So today we're going to be again talking about the direction of the Lord. So let's pray over the word. So Father, we just thank you again for your goodness, your kindness, your grace that you've shown us. And we ask that you bless us now as we come to the teaching of your word. Father, you said that you are the great teacher. Although you use men, you call men to be teachers in the body, you are the ultimate teacher, Lord. So I pray that you will use this vessel for your glory this morning. Bless your people, Lord, that they may hear your word. Let this word touch them in their hearts where they need it. They may be transformed. Lord God, to be changed in the name of Jesus. Amen. I spoke to you earlier today, uh, just uh, as an unction from the Lord, about the necessity of letting the change that God is trying to work out in your life, to let that change happen. So we're going to further that same thought today as we, we enter into our, our, our lesson. But, and to do that, I'm just going to um, take a page from my own history and share with you this morning. Now, if you look at your notes, our message is called, uh, Now Seriously, Hon. Now Seriously, Hon. That's the title of our message today. Some of you guys know the history of that phrase, so I'll share with the rest of you. I know you might find this very hard to believe uh, because of the very serious nature person that I am, but uh, 36 years ago when I married my wife, I was somewhat of a prankster. And, uh, and I would joke and tease her occasionally. And sometimes I'd get on her nerves. <laughs> every once in a while, every blue moon, I'd get on her nerves. And she would get upset and I'd be like, just kidding, sorry. <laughs> you know, and so there's a, there's a proverb that covers that. It says, you know, and it's talking about somebody who's done something really stupid. You see that in Proverbs 26, 19. It says, if a man deceives his neighbor and then he gets discovered, he says, oh, I was just kidding. <laughs> it's like, it don't make it all right. Just because you say, i sorry. And so <laughs> what we worked out in the economy of our marriage was this. My wife says, okay, there's times when you're kidding and it's just getting on my nerves. And I said, we didn't get it. So we came up with this, this buzzword, this, this power phrase, that when she would say, now seriously, hon, that was my cue to whatever kind of foolishness I was into, I needed to stop. Because whatever it was, it was starting to get on her nerves. So she would say, now seriously, hon, and I'd be like, ugh. I was just getting to the good part. <laughs> But that brings us to the point today is that as we come before the Lord, especially we start this, this new year, this new decade, and everybody's looking at, you know, trying to be fresh new starts. And, and it's, it's like the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us, now seriously, huh? Now seriously. Because there comes a time in our life where we have to look at and evaluate what we're doing and ask ourselves if we're really achieving what we should be achieving. And we see this principle go throughout scripture. We see this, one of the things we talk about in our Bible studies all the time is that God repeats himself over and over and over and over to his people. And primarily my, my answer is because we're stupid. We just don't get it. You know, and there's times when God just says, now seriously, 
Seriously, Ray, listen to me. It's time to change what you're doing. We see this in the life of Moses as he led the people of God. He brought them out of Egypt, as you know, and he led them through the wilderness. And then he got into the border of the promised land and he was told by God, you're going to die. And we know how Moses pled with God, Lord, I've been doing this for so long. I just want to get into the promised land. And God said, no, don't even ask me again. You're going to die. Joshua's going to place, uh, replace you, give him the necessary instructions to come up on this mountain and die. And so we know that this is what Moses did. But in the, in the mission of that, in the transmission of that, he wrote the book of Deuteronomy. And what the book of Deuteronomy is, is simply this. It's literally called the second telling or the retelling. And he's rehearsing with them the things that God has told them over that 40-year transmission. And he walks them through that entire experience. And what he says to them is, now you're at the brink of going into the promised land. Now seriously, let's get this right. He said, remember your fathers, how they died in the wilderness because they worshiped the golden calf and, and they got beat up and some of them died there and other ones died because they didn't believe the promise of God. He goes, remember all that? And they go, yes, sir, we remember that. He goes, now seriously, let's get it right. And so he tells them, now seriously, you say you're going to serve the Lord. Now seriously, it's time for you to do that. And we go on, now Joshua goes through his life and he's come to there and he had his great adventures. He had the walls of Jericho. He had to take it in the populating of the promised land. He saw all these wonderful things come to pass and now he's at his deathbed at 110 years old. And he goes before the nation of Israel and he says to them the same thing Moses said. He said, now seriously, it's time to serve the Lord. Now I point that out to you because of this. One of the things you find out if you look at the 24th chapter of Joshua is that when Joshua begins this, this, this last presentation, this last exaltation uh, to the people of Israel, he gathers their leaders and their princes. He says, come, let me talk to you about what's really going on. Let me show you what's real, what's beginning to happen here. And all the nation, the, the, the leaders of the nation of Israel come together. And one of the things he tells them is, is that now you need to put away your gods, your false gods. And if you're thinking, you have to do like I did and just stop and go, what? These are the same people that walked out of Egypt. They walked through the Red Sea. They saw God defeat their enemies one after another. These are the same people who eventually got in obedience and walked across the Jordan, who came into the promised land and saw God push down the walls of Jericho. These are the same people who saw God defeat tribe after tribe after tribe. And now as many years later, they're inhabiting this promised land. They have cities they didn't build, gardens they didn't plant, and they're living in this promised land. And Joshua tells them, put away your strange gods. The last time I spoke to you back before I left here in December, I talked to you out of Joshua 24. And I gave you a message, an, an exhortation then. As for me, where Joshua began to say in verse 14, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we talked about that before leading up to that, how he said, you need to put away your strange gods. Will that be the gods of your fathers on the other side of the flood, talking about their heritage. Now we go back all the way back to the time of Jacob and the founding of the patriarchs. We found that they had false gods and God had to tell them over and over again, get rid of these idols. Then he says, whether you serve the gods of Egypt, that means the gods of this present culture, this dominating governing culture that we live in, the gods of Egypt, the gods of the world. Then he said, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live in now. Meaning this, your own personal culture, your family culture, this, this right now kind of revelant, uh, revelancy. God, he's saying, put away those gods, those ideas, those things of, uh, of worship that you hold value to and you give such value to. He says, put them away. Then he says, choose today. He said, if you think it'd be evil to serve the Lord, you decide, but you got to decide, but choose today whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers or did you serve on the other side of the flood, the gods of Egypt, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live in now. He said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
And I said to you last time I spoke to you, let's, let's narrow that down and say, forget about me and my house. Let's just start with you. As for me, I will serve the Lord. As for me, I'm making the decision for the only person in the cosmos that I have control over. Well, some control over me. I can't make you do anything. I can't make my wife do anything. I have to check my grandson because he looks at me at the side of his eye to see if I'm still watching him. But I can control me by the power of God. So I had said to you last time, as for me, I will serve the Lord. And so today we take it a step further. Where Joshua is saying to the nation of Israel in the same way that Moses said to the nation of Israel, in the same way the Spirit of God has said to me, and now I say to you, now seriously, now seriously, to get ourselves in a better position, open your Bibles to the 24th chapter of Joshua. We're going to read a few verses together. Verses 16 through 29. Everybody there? Verses 16 through 29. This is after Joshua has given him this great speech. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is where we're starting from. This is our launching point to have that in context. And the people answered and said, far be it from us that we should forsake Jehovah to serve other gods. For Jehovah, our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and who did great signs before our eyes and preserved us all the way where we went, wherein we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And Jehovah drove out before us all the peoples and the Amorites and the inhabitants of the land. So therefore we will serve Jehovah for he is our God. Now listen to what Joshua says next. And Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve Jehovah. Now what did he start it off by saying you need to decide to serve God? And the people say, yes, after you gave us that great rousing speech, we're going to serve God because we know all the things that God has done for us. He brought us out of Egypt. He took us through the wilderness. He defeated all these. We, yes, we'll serve God. And Joshua stops him. He sobers him up. He goes, you can't serve God. And this is what he says. And Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve God for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. Now, let's look at this. See, this is the part where we get in trouble. Holiness matters. Sanctification matters. We live in a world and a culture and a society that tells us that we have rights and that we can do things our own way. We have, uh, we have rights to be satisfied. We have rights to have pleasure. We have rights to not be offended. We have all these rights. And sometimes in observing our rights, we sideline holiness. We put aside sanctification. And so we say we are Christians. We bow our knee as we sang this morning to the name of the Lord. But then we live our lives as if there was no real God watching over us. We live our lives as if we won't have to answer to a God for the reasons for why we do what we do. We live our lives as if we can do whatever we want, however we want to do it. So the Spirit of God says to you and he says to me, now seriously, Joshua says to them, you can't serve God. God is holy. He is jealous. You think you're going to keep continuing just doing all this stupid stuff and God's just going to keep winking at it? Because that's my boy. I love him. He's my boy. You go ahead and you do that. No. What does he say? Let's read on what it says. Say, he's a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake Jehovah and serve strange gods, he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, he hath done you good. Now, you see, we, we, we confuse ourselves because we think because God loves us because God has blessed us that he won't turn and pop us on our backside. And 
he will. He will. Because, let's put this in a bright perspective. Some glad morning when this life is over. Y'all getting with me? Let's put this in the right perspective. One day, they said, one of these mornings, it won't be long. You'll look for me and I'll be gone. Miss that note. I'm going to a place where I have nothing, nothing, nothing to do. But I'll just walk around heaven all day. See, we are looking forward to those days, right? But outside of there is this great white throne altar. It's not white because that's they had a cell on paint. It's white because it's pure. It represents the righteousness of God. And we're going to stand in the presence of that righteous God. And the Bible tells us none who are unclean or unholy can dwell in the new city, in the new Jerusalem. And the reason God takes holiness so seriously is because he is holy and he wants you to be with him. And so we give ourselves permission. We say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm a Christian, however. And that's where you get in trouble because the but or the however is the strange God that you're serving. And just like Joshua, the Spirit of God says to you and I this morning, put away your strange gods. The beauty of it is, is that the joy that you are seeking after, the life that you are created to have, is on the other side of that submission. When we surrender ourselves to God, then and only then can we truly be and enjoy the fullness of what God created us to be. If I insert my own selfish will into my marriage, I may get my way, but I lose my right. My marriage will never be the right that God has designed it to be if I am imposing my will into it. The only time my marriage can be what God wants it to be is when I am the type of husband that God told me that a husband should be. The only time our marriage can be what it's supposed to be is when my wife is being the type of wife that God says a wife ought to be. And so if I am going to have the liberty and the freedom and the power of living in the promised land and the government of the promised land, living on the righteousness and the power and the right now manifestation of God's power resonating in my life, it's going to happen when and only if and when I surrender myself to the will of God. Because if I continue to insist on holding on to those strange gods, the very same God who blessed me will turn and do me hurt. Now that's what the Bible says. I know a lot of people tell you God would never do that. That's not how God operates, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God will bust your butt. Whoop you. But why does he do it? Because he's holy. And he loves you. And he wants you to be with him. I told you a while ago that I, I was in New York and I was walking down the street and I was praying, just seeking the Lord's face, just trying to renew myself in his presence. And I'm walking, I'm looking at people's faces and I see so much emptiness. Emptiness. And you don't have to go to New York to see this. This is just where the revelation happened for me this most recently. I saw emptiness, people who had lost their dreams. Life had just become to a redundancy. They wake up in the morning, they go to work, they make money to pay bills, to buy food, to eat, to sleep, to wake up and do it again the next day. Just emptiness. I'm like, Lord, you did not die so that we could have this level of emptiness. You died so we could have life, and that what? More abundantly. And we're not talking about money. We're talking about the richness of life. That means the richness of God's presence in your life, the fullness of joy. When you wake up knowing that I am in the place and in the station, functioning in the way that God designed me to be. Now seriously, God says. Joshua continues, he says, 
He will turn and do you hurt and consume you after he hath done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve Jehovah. And Joshua said unto the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen you, Jehovah, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away the strange gods that are among you and incline your heart unto Jehovah, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, Jehovah our God we will serve and to his voice we will hearken. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote those words, wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of Jehovah. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto you, for it hath heard all the words of Jehovah which he spoke unto us. And it shall be a witness against you, lest you deny your God. And Joshua dismissed the people, every man to his inheritance. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Jehovah, died, being 110 years old. So we have to come back to this place where we ask ourselves, are we serious? Did you all see that phrase in where Joshua, after Joshua told them all this stuff, and they say, yeah, we'll serve God. What's the next thing that Joshua said? Put away the strange gods. Put away the strange gods. They still had them. See, these strange gods, they're dear to you. You have history with them. You are attached to them emotionally, culturally, out of fear. You have these things and you hold on to them. They help you cope. Some of you, when you get stressed, you turn to that strange God, trying to find comfort for yourself. Some of you, when you get a little money in your hand, you turn to that strange God, trying to find a way to make yourself feel better. You got these strange gods you're holding on to, and you know what they are. I'm not, I don't know what's going on in your life, but you do. And by the Spirit of God, I pray that he touch each one of us this morning and reveals it to us so we can let go. But they said, we will serve God. Oh, no, I got, he's the one that delivered. Joshua says, put away the strange gods. You have to put away the strange gods. We have to remember, the unction for this is not just because, like I said, I want to try to polish my own stone and make it shine, but it's because God has loved us so much that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. He gave us his only begotten son, and all we ask of us is that we believe, that we accept the gift of this, this great salvation. And if we do, Romans 3.23 tells us what, that the law was given that we might be saved. And 23 says, for all have come short of the glory of God. There's not one of us who can stand here and look at our own feet and say, look, I stand in my own righteousness. Because the Bible tells us what about our own righteousness? Our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. That means the best we can do ain't good enough. So we come back to God and we say, Lord God, I'm messed up from the ground up. Lord, I need you to fix me up. We surrender ourselves to him. We say, Lord, cleanse me. Lord, I have a tendency to reach back for this strange God. Teach me how not to do that. Teach me how to identify. David said, what well, search me and see if there be any wicked way in me and what? Lead me in the way everlasting. So sometimes we lie to ourselves about the strange gods we hold on to. That's why it's so important that we come before God and we say, God, search me. God, show me my heart because I lie to myself so good, Lord. I tell myself the lies I want to hear. And so they're easy to swallow. So I'm asking you, Lord, instead of letting me just hold on to those strange gods, help me, Lord, to let go of that and grab onto you. Be like the woman in the Gospels that says that she was so bowed down that she, all she could hold onto was the hem of his garment. And if all that you can grab of Jesus is the hem of his garment, I'm here to tell you that's still enough. If all you can get is a handful of his garment, church is still enough. Open your Bibles, please, to 2 Timothy chapter uh, chapter 1. We're going to read verse 10. We want to identify ourselves in Christ. We want to identify ourselves in Christ. What is it that we are saying when we say now seriously, when my wife said that to me, I knew exactly what I needed to turn away from and turn to. 
I knew that there was a certain way of thinking and behavior that she wanted me to stop and start something else. So we want to find out what is God telling us when he says to you and I, now seriously, I want you to serve me. What is he asking you to do? Your Bible, you should be there now at Peter. He's in the second Peter chapter one, verse eight. He says, my brothers and sisters, God called you and chose you to be his. That's the first thing we understand is that God called you. You didn't wake up one day and decide to go find Jesus. God called you. He chose you. He brought you to himself. He says, now do your best to live in a way that shows you really are God's called and chosen people. If you do this, you will never fall. Now, I need to give you a point of clarification is that this doing your best is not just you trying harder because your righteousness is always as filthy rags. But doing your best means surrendering to God. Walking in righteousness to him. Let him work through you. And when you have that level of dependency on God, you will not fall because it's not you that's doing it. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's Christ in you working out the will and to do God's good will. So when we lean on him, he carries us through. So as we're striving, as we're striving for righteousness, and I want you to do this this morning, I'm going to encourage you to strive toward righteousness. But as you're striving, and this is not about you trying to be better, you trying to be good. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 that when we begin to strive, we want to cease from the working of our own striving and enter into the rest of God. That means I'm going to come before God not trying to do my best to be good, but looking at the cross of Jesus Christ and saying, Lord, you died so that I I could be cleansed. Father, you said that your Holy Spirit dwells inside of me. I'm going to lean on that. I'm going to trust you, Lord, now to make me the way I need to be. I'm going to trust you, God, to give me the, the power to cling unto righteousness. It's not about me saying, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do this. Because when we make those kind of resolutions, they don't last. But what I want you to do is say, God, this is what I want to do. I want to hold to your hand. I want to cling to you, Jesus. I'm a, if I can't get nothing but the hem of your garment, I'm going to grab the hem. I'm going to hold on, Lord. Like little Zacchaeus, I might need to climb up in a tree to get your attention, but whatever it takes, Lord, I'm going to do it. I want to be with you, God, that much. I'm going to strive to enter into your rest. Now, let's get ready to close this. Let's bring it into a close. I want you to play the imagination game with me. Let's go back to Egypt. Imagine that you're one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And for the last 470 years, you have been slaves in Egypt. Over 400 years now, you have been slaves in Egypt. And this guy Moses shows up and says, God's gonna take you out of here. But things don't get better, they get worse. And now you've gone through a series of trials where you've seen the miracles of God. And now Moses comes in and tells you, take a lamb. Keep that lamb. On the 14th day of the month, you're going to kill that lamb. And you're going to take the blood from that lamb. You're going to paint it on the, the doorpost of your house. That night, we want you to cook and eat the meat of that lamb. Eat this, this bread. And I want you to do it with your belt on, with your shoes on, with your staff in your hand. Pack up your trash because you're leaving. Now, all you've known is 400 years of slavery. You were a slave, your mama was a slave, your daddy was a slave, your granddaddy was a slave, great granddaddy was a slave. Everybody you know has been a slave. You've never known life any other way other than that of slavery. The morning comes, the city is filled with the wailing and crying of parents as they go into the room to find their oldest child dead in bed. The farmer goes out and finds his Firstborn sheep, goat, ox, dead. Death has swept through the kingdom, but it has passed over you. Now in the vehicle of your imagination, ask yourself, what must that have felt like? To wake up, see all that death, know that you were protected, and now to know that you're free. You walk out. You go through all the miracles we just got through reading about. Now you're established in the promised land. You're there. Now let's fast forward several thousand years. You're in the first century church. You're there with the apostles. Jesus has been crucified. He's been raised again from the dead. 
Everybody knows the message. You're preaching the message. Just hear miracles being done. And now you are living. You are just an average person living in first century Palestine, still under Roman rule. You get up in the morning, you do your work. Imagine, I want you to see what life was like. Think of life in the promised land under Joshua. Think of life in first century church under the apostle leadership, spirit of God moving through the church every day. And some of you might look at that and think, man, that life is so different than ours. Let's look at it in reality. They lived in a world where abortion was on demand. Rome believed in, pushed, preached abortion. Homosexuality was everywhere. They had lying politicians, unfair taxes. They had people who hated them and was trying to kill them. Women were being raped, men were being murdered. Children were being abused. Kind of sounds like life today, doesn't it? The point of that is this, that when God told the people of Egypt, of Israel, after they came out of Egypt, now seriously, live like this. When Moses told the people as they were going into the promised land, now seriously, live like this. When the apostles told the church, now seriously, live like this. These orders were given to people who lived in existence pretty much like the one that you're living today. So when I say to you this morning, now seriously, huh? Choose you this day whom you will serve. Understand, you don't have an unfair advantage or disadvantage. Things are not worse for you than they were for your grandparents. It's just different. The only difference is the mechanisms of delivery. Pornography was rampant. Sex clubs were rampant. The only difference is they didn't have the internet to tell you where to find it. People told you. Brothels were rampant. All those things were real. They were, they were, they were there then and they're here now. The only thing difference is the mechanisms of delivery. So it seems much more abundant in our day. And probably quantity speaking, it probably is. But the circumstances into which you are being called to live for God have not changed. As we close, Romans chapter 12 tells us that we gotta make a decision to not be like the world. Romans chapter 12 verses one and two tells us don't be like the world, but it's our reasonable service to be this living sacrifice. And that last passage of scripture I gave you, I think is in Peter. Second Peter chapter three. There the apostle is talking about the judgment that is to come. He has told us that the world as we know it is gonna be consumed in fire. The very earth is gonna be burned. And all those who do not know the Lord Read it in Revelation chapter 20. All those who do not know the Lord is going to be swept up and cast into hell and there they will be forever. Forever. Tormented in hell forever. I'll come to you. But the Spirit of God is saying to you and I, how should we live knowing that these things are true? Is there someone that you know who's not saved? How should you live knowing that that person is going to go to hell forever? How should we live knowing that the person we don't like who lives next door to us or works in the same place we work. We hate their guts, we don't like them. Their breath smells bad. But is that a good enough reason to let them go to hell? Do we let our light shine sufficiently that they can see Jesus in us? 
See, this is what he means when he says, now serve the Lord. It's not about just get me getting mine, my making sure that I'm right. It's me living unto the loving God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then loving my neighbor as I love myself, being a witness to that neighbor. So as we come to the end of this message and the beginning of this year, I say to you, as my wife said to me so many years ago, now seriously, hon, and the question I ask you is what Joshua asked the nation of Israel, whom will you serve? And if you say you're gonna serve Jehovah, then put away your strange gods. It's an act of your will. Put away your strange gods. Surrender yourself to him. This is, it's not a negotiation, it's a surrender. It's me saying, Lord, I give up. You take control. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna challenge you to make that decision for Jesus today. I'm gonna to pray with you, pray for you. I'm gonna ask you to make that decision to serve the Lord today. To God, make me a different person. Make me what you want me to be. So we're gonna pray. Father God, we stand before you in the name of Jesus. And we ask you, Lord, to look upon our hearts, upon our consciousness. Lord, we pray like David prayed. Search me and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We ask you, Father, to help us to identify the strange gods that we hold in our heart. You told us through the prophet that the human heart is deceitfully wicked. Who could even know it? I thank you, Lord, that you know it. You see us. You know who we really are. And Father, as we come this morning, I pray that you would speak to the hearts of your people, Lord. That Father, this not be a time where they just make a resolution to try harder. But Father, this would be a, so, a total surrender of themselves to you. So I'm asking you even now, Lord, in the, whole, in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would move through this congregation. Begin to touch your people, Lord God. For those who need to repent, Lord God, they have sin in their lives. Father, perhaps it's the sin of unbelief, like the nation of Israel who perished in the wilderness. You tell us in, in Hebrews chapter three and four that they perished in the wilderness because they didn't believe. Perhaps there's those here this morning, Father, who are walking in unbelief. They have no faith. I'm asking you this morning to touch their hearts, to bring them to the place of repentance for their unbelief. Perhaps those here, Lord God, have been beat down by circumstances and situations and people have lied to them, told them what they would and could and can't do. And that lie has reigned in dominance over them and has fashioned their lives, oh God. We're praying for deliverance for that one, Lord God. Perhaps there's others who simply lied to themselves. So Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus, touch your people. Help each one of us, Father, to grasp a hold of your truth, to surrender ourselves to you in the name of Jesus.